Hi friends, welcome to Beautifully Bookish Bethany. In today's video I'm going to be talking about all of the books that I read in the month of January. We have a lot of ground to cover in this video, so I would suggest getting a snack and a drink because I think we're going to be here for a minute. I did a lot of reading in January. January is often one of my biggest reading months of the year and that was certainly true this time around. Part of this I think is that I got sick and one of my kids got sick and so there were some solid days there where all I was doing was reading and sleeping so I got through a lot of stuff and I usually read a lot but this month was even more than usual. That said, if you are new to my end of month wrap ups, the way that these work is I start by talking about all my reading stats for the month. I'm a big stats nerd. I love doing this. I know some of y'all geek out with me about it, but if you're not interested, you're welcome to skip forward to where I start actually reviewing the books that I read in the month. I'll talk about all the books that I read in order from lowest rated to highest rated. One thing to note is that a good chunk of these books I have talked about in other places. A lot of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up and so for those books I am just going to tell you the book and the star rating and if you want to hear more detailed thoughts I will direct you there. So I'm going to link my mid-month wrap-up up above if you want to go and check that out. With that said, let's go ahead and dive into those reading stats. First month of 2023. In January, I read 39 books. Yes, 39 for a total of 12,571 pages, which is an average of 406 pages per day. This is not the most pages per day that I have ever read, but it is definitely on the higher end. I don't usually like to read much more than 350, 360 pages per day, but again, it was a special case with getting sick, and I did a lot of audiobook listening this month. In January, 19 of the books that I read were either advanced reader copies or books sent to me for review. I DNF'd two books. I read two graphic novels. Four of the books that I read were indie or self-published. Three were translated fiction and three were rereads. Looking at format, as I said, I did read a lot of audiobooks this month. In January, 23 of the books that I read were audiobooks, 14 of them were physical books, and two of them were ebooks. I was not in the mood for reading ebooks in January, and uh, you, you can tell. <laughs> In terms of where those audiobooks are coming from, 13 of them are what I term shelf, which means that I had a physical copy of them on my TBR shelf and I got them off via audio or primarily via audio. Some of these I might have partially read the book physically and also listened alongside it. Seven of the audiobooks were from Audible. Four of them were from my library. Five of them were from Libro.fm, some of which were audio influencer copies. Libro.fm very kindly offers me a small selection of audiobooks I can have for free in exchange for mentioning them. I do think they're a fantastic service and I also subscribe to them every month. And if you're an audiobook listener and you want to support your local indie bookstores, I would recommend it because you can choose your local indie and the profits of your purchase go to support that indie bookstore, which is amazing. Five of these audiobooks were review copies from NetGalley and two of them were from Scribd. Taking a look at target age demographics, unsurprisingly the majority of these books were for adults. 27 of the books that I read were for an adult audience, seven of them were for a YA audience, four were middle grade, and one was for children. I will say I've been reading a lot more middle grade than I used to and I think part of this is because I've been reading middle grade books at night to my kids before bed which has been really fun for them and for me and you're also then getting those middle grade book reviews so. I hope you enjoy it. Next up, let's look at publication date. The earliest published work that I read was 441 BCE <laughs> because I read a Greek tragedy, so uh, very, very early. And I read 18 books that were published prior to 2022. So I read quite a bit of backlist this month, more than usual. I also read eight 2022 releases and 14 2023 releases. Looking at author demographics, if you're new here, you might not know, I prioritize and value reading from marginalized authors. And so every month, my goal is to read around 50% from Black, Indigenous, and Person of Color authors, and at least 25% from queer authors. I track it every month to make sure that I'm trying to hit those benchmarks because it is something that I value. In January, 48.7% of the books that I read were by Black, Indigenous, and Person of Color authors, which is great, and 30.8% were by openly queer authors. Love it. Next is genres. 
by far my most read genre was uh, no one surprised fantasy. Of course, it was it was fantasy. I read 13 fantasy books. I also read a lot of sci fi, nine sci fi, five horror, only three romance. I didn't read a lot of romance in January, which you know, I'm, I'm all right with that. Of those romance, two of them were contemporary romance, and one of them was speculative romance. I also read three literary fiction, two nonfiction, one historical fiction, one history and biography, one mystery, and one thriller. Then let's take a look at my star ratings. And uh, this was an interesting month. I am going to tell you up front, some of the lower star ratings, you will not see me talk about those books in this video because they are for a secret project. So you're going to have to stay tuned for February. <laughs> there, something is, is coming. In January, I did not give any books one star. Two books got one and a half stars. Three books got two stars. One book got two and a half stars. Four books got three stars. Five books got three and a half stars. Seven books got four stars. Eight books got four and a half stars, seven books got five stars, and two books got six stars, which in my personal rating scale is a favorite of the year. So overall, I had a really strong reading month. I read a lot of books that I was enjoying, but I for sure had some lower rated things as well. So we're going to talk about it. Last thing before I get to the books is we're going to take a look at my progress with my yearly reading goals. For 2023, I set four challenge TBRs for myself that are smaller than the ones from last year, and I've made some good progress. I have read one out of the five books on my classics TBR. I've read one out of the five books on my sci-fi fantasy TBR. I've read two out of the six books on my nonfiction TBR. Yay. And and I have not yet read any of the six books on my Star Wars TBR. So great progress for the first month of the year. I'm very pleased. With that said, let's go ahead and talk about all of the books that I read, beginning with my DNFs. And the one book that I cannot review for you because it is a HarperCollins title, and that is Daughter of the Moon Goddess by Su Lin Tan. Unfortunately, we are still in a strike for the HarperCollins union, although good news, HarperCollins did agree to come back to the table and bargain with them before then doing a classic union busting move of announcing layoffs for 5% of their workforce. So that's great. But hopefully they will come to some kind of an accord soon and have a new contract so that I can go ahead and review all of the HarperCollins books that I have been reading and have been unable to discuss. But uh, Daughter of the Moon Goddess by Su Lin Tan, unfortunately, is a HarperCollins title. So I will not be talking publicly about this until the strike has ended in support of the union. However, if you want to hear my thoughts on this, you could join channel memberships or Patreon because it's our book club pick and uh, there will be a live show about it, but that will not be public. So there you go. I did DNF two books. The first one is Women Talking by Miriam Tobes. I listened to 22% of this before deciding to DNF. You know, I, I had actually, this hadn't really been on my radar, but I got invited to a screening of the film and I thought it looked interesting. So I decided to try reading the book before going to the movie. And I, I, the movie was excellent. Highly recommend the movie. I think the movie corrected a lot of the problems that I had with the book and part of the reason that I DNF'd it. If you're not familiar with it, it's a novel loosely based on real events where several years ago, I want to say around 2010, but I'm not sure of the date, so don't quote me on that. There was a Mennonite community in South America where the majority of the women and young girls in the community had been repeatedly drugged and sexually assaulted at night by some of the men of their community and were kind of gaslit into believing that it was demons attacking them. So it's like really, really horrific stuff. But this book is a novelization of the moment where they gathered together to discuss what they were going to do in retribution, whether they were going to leave the community, stay and fight or do nothing. The film is amazing. The book made some weird choices. It's technically the minutes of the meeting, which was taken by a man because he's um, because he was the only one of them that was literate enough to do that. But it's a weird choice for a book that's talking about sexual violence towards women to have a man narrating it. And quite literally, because I was listening to the audiobook, there is a male narrator. And I just between that and the way that it was 
handling some of the horrific things that happened. I was just like, I can't, I can't do this. This is not going to work for me. The movie is excellent. The movie, I think, did a great job and made a very smart choice of changing the person narrating the story to a girl. Um, yeah, so highly recommend seeing the movie. The movie was fantastic. The book, I was like, okay, I see where this was going, but I can't, I can't get through this. So I DNF'd it. The other book that I DNF'd this month, unfortunately, was The Watchmaker of Filigree Street by Natasha Pulley. I listened to 45% of this and then decided to DNF it. <sighs> Listen, as beautiful as this cover is, and as much as I wanted to like it, I just, it, it, it my reasons were twofold. Number one, I was bored. I, I found this to be a pretty dull and uninteresting book. I know there are people who love it. I found it boring. And maybe I would have pushed through if it was just a little bit boring. But then on top of it, I have some real questions about the choice to have this mystical figure watchmaker be a Japanese man and use some, you know, kind of offensive language to describe him that even though, yeah, they might have used it in Victorian England, we certainly don't today and this is not a Victorian book. I, I, I have questions. I don't love that the person of color in the text is this wise mystical figure. I, yeah. So I, I DNF'd it. Oh well. If you enjoyed it, great. I was not having a good time and I was kind of uncomfortable with some of the choices being made. Moving on, let's go ahead and talk about all of the books that I did finish reading in January. I gave two books one and a half stars and unfortunately I cannot talk about them because they are both for a super secret project that is coming to you mid-February. So stay tuned for that. I'm very excited about this project. I hope you will be as well. But um, yeah, there's a few books that I read this month that I can't discuss yet, and including my two one and a half stars. In January, I gave three books two stars, and one of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. That book was Where Darkness Blooms by Andrea Hanna. If you want to hear my thoughts on that, go check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also gave two stars to Arch Conspirator by Veronica Roth, and I talk about this in my Antigone video that I put up. Very nerdy of me, I know, but it was really fun to do a video where I reread Antigone and read three retellings of Antigone, including Arch Conspirator. This is a sci fi version set in a dystopian future, and as much as I wanted to love this, I just found this to be very disappointing. It is simultaneously too on the nose in following Antigone with the character names and the plot beats, while also having plot holes in some of the added material for this dystopian world. This is a novella that is trying to use the story of Antigone to talk about bodily autonomy and issues like pregnancy and abortion, which I think is valid and a really great idea. I just don't know that this executed on it very well. It was not great. So two stars for Arch Conspirator, which is a bummer because I wanted to love it. Maybe you'll do better than I did. I also gave two stars to The Cradle of Ice by James Rollins. I, you know, this book is just very okay. And that's what two stars is, is it was okay. It wasn't terrible. It also wasn't that great. I, I just, I just think for how long this book is at over 600 pages, I need more from it to stay invested in the series. I had read the first book last year and had mixed feelings about it, but there were some things that I really liked about it and I was intrigued enough to try to continue when I was offered the sequel. I think at this point I'm going to be done with the series because I just don't think the problems I had with the first book were just worse in the second book. So I, I don't think he's trying to <laughs> correct those things. This just doesn't feel like modern fantasy. This doesn't feel like the kind of fantasy that's getting published today. I, I saw one person say that this feels like James Rollins hasn't read anything published in fantasy in the last 15 years. And I'm like, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's fair. It is very slow paced. And while there are some scenes that are interesting, there are some world building elements that I think are really intriguing and cool. It is so long. And a lot of the length is 
boring and I just don't care enough to stick with it for this many pages if I'm not going to be more invested. That on top of the fact that I don't think he does a great job writing female characters. Am I shocked? No, I mean there's a lot of dudes writing fantasy who aren't great at female characters. There are some that are excellent at it, I will say. There are some that I trust to do it well. Mm. This, it's, it's not great. I mean, for the most part, your female characters fall into one of two categories. They're either the like special chosen one or they're kind of sexual objects who mostly exist for plot points related to the men around them. It, you know, so two stars. It was okay. Is it the worst thing I've read? No. Does it have some interesting ideas and world building elements at its core? Yes. And, you know, if that can carry you through this series, if that's enough for you, great, more power to you. Unfortunately for me, I think this is where I'm going to be done with it. It's just not something I care enough about to be invested for like this length of a book. Yeah, if it was shorter, maybe I would keep going, but no. Then I gave four books three stars. Two of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up and one of them is for that secret project so I can't talk about it. The two three-star reads that I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up were Sea Sparrow by Kristen Kishore and The Game Masters of Garden Place by Dennis Markell. So if you want to hear about either of those go check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also gave three stars to Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies by Heather Fawcett. This I had as an e-arc from NetGalley and it is a very interesting book that I suspect is going to elicit a wide range of responses from readers and I think is already doing that. I think there are going to be people who will pick this up and be like, oh my god, this is so boring and overly descriptive. And I think there are other people who are going to pick it up and be like, oh, I love this so much. It's like super wonderful and cozy and has lots of fairy stuff. And, you know, neither side is exactly wrong. I think part of it just depends on what you like. I would classify the majority of this book as cozy fantasy, which I am so pleased that cozy fantasy is having its moment because I'm generally a big fan of it. This is descriptive, slow paced, slice of life, spending time with characters. And I am a big fan of that. My biggest issue with this book, to be honest, is that I think it didn't lean into being cozy enough. I think this book has a real tone problem in that a lot of it is very, very cozy, centered a lot on fairy mythology. And then it has these moments of very dark, startling violence. I also think it's too long. I think there was a point in the book where I was like, okay, this feels like it should be wrapping up. Oh no, oh no, we're still going. Oh, there's like a whole other plot arc happening. Oh, okay. So I didn't love the pacing of it. And I felt like the tone was a bit discordant for me. I probably would have liked it better if it had just been a little bit shorter and really leaned harder into being cozy fantasy instead of trying to do the super dark violent magic moments because I just don't think it fits together. Your mileage on this may vary. Some people are reading this and they're like, oh my god, I love it. It's like the best, coziest, happiest thing ever. And I'm like, yes, part of it. <laughs> like, but not the whole thing. Yeah, so three stars. There were parts of this that I really liked. I do think that people who dislike cozy fantasy. So if you are not a fan of something like Legends and Lattes, for example, this book has a lot more plot to it than Legends and Lattes, but the cozy elements of it are more in that vein of like slow, very descriptive slice of life type stuff. If you do not like that, this may not be for you unless you're just really into fairy mythology because there is a lot of it. The plot follows this super prickly woman who is doing field research on fairies. She is a professor. She does work on this and she's trying to get tenure. And uh, alongside her comes a colleague who she finds really annoying because he's good looking and charming and cheerful and she just doesn't like that very much. So it's funny. It has really charming moments but then it has other stuff that I'm like why are we what um, okay why are we doing this? So I don't know. Three stars. It, if that sounds up your alley maybe give it a try. Next up is three and a half star reads and uh, you know let's say there are three of them that I can talk about and two of the three I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books are 
The Davenports by Crystal Marquis, and The Nemesis Effect by Michael Schotter. So if you want to hear more about those, go check out my mid-month wrap-up. My final three and a half star read was Highly Suspicious and Unfairly Cute by Talia Hibbert. You might know I am a big fan of Talia Hibbert's adult romances. I think they're fantastic. And this is her debut YA romance, which of course I wanted to pick up because I've really enjoyed her adult stuff. And I liked it. I thought that there were parts of it that were really charming. I liked some of the mental health representation that it had. It had positive fat representation. This is a contemporary romance between two British teenagers who were childhood best friends turned enemies who now have to work together at this project where they're gonna have to like survive in the woods basically. That's like the, the short version of it. The girl is super prickly. The guy has OCD and anxiety, and so I appreciate that it has some of the representation on page. And for a teen love story, I liked this. I think it's good. I think if I had read this as a teenager, I probably would have enjoyed it more than I did as an adult, which is completely fine. It was very cute. I think a lot of people are gonna like it. I didn't love it the way that I've loved some of her other books, and I'm always a tough sell too on YA romances where the couple gets together and thinks they're going to be together forever and it's going to work out, and I feel like there was a little bit too much of that for me where I was like, oh, okay, I mean, okay, whatever. But, you know, I'm in my mid-30s, <laughs> not like 17, 18, like the kids in the story. So three and a half stars, I rounded up to four on Goodreads. I think it's good. I just didn't love it in the same way I have some of her other stuff. So do with that what you will. Next, let's talk about my four star reads. This month there were seven of them and two of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. Those books are The Spite House by Johnny Compton and The Dark Fantastic, Race and the Imagination from Harry Potter to The Hunger Games by Ebony Elizabeth Thomas. If you want to hear about those, go check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also gave four stars to Antigone by Sophocles, and I am going to point you to my Antigone video if you want to hear more thoughts on this. This was a reread for me. I've read this a couple of times before in school, but I hadn't read it in a long time, and I think it holds up really well. I think it's very accessible for a modern audience. This is the translation that I read by Robert Bagg and James Scully, and I really like it. It's a newer translation, and I think the language makes it even more more accessible to the modern reader and it also has a nice introduction to it that I think is really good. So if you're interested go check that out or go watch my Antigone video. Also if you want to hear my version of a recap of what happens in Antigone that was kind of fun to do, check out the Antigone video. I also gave four stars to Season of Love by Helena Greer. This was adorable. I was sent a copy of this unsolicited for review, and I ended up getting a copy of the audiobook from my library, which I really liked. It, I mean, like, look at the cover. It's so cute. It's time to make the Yuletide gay. This is a holiday romance that is both very cute and also dealing with some heavier issues and themes. Following a Jewish woman who is pretty much estranged from her family, who returns home when she finds out that her great aunt, who had owned a Christmas tree farm as a Jewish woman had died and left her a stake in the company alongside a couple of other people, including a plus size butch lesbian who managed the Christmas tree farm and like grew the trees and doesn't really like her at first. And they've got a lot of stuff they have to work through in terms of their own personal family history and trauma. So there, you know, there is heavier elements to this, but also it's really cute and quirky and fun and I really really liked it a lot. It is worth noting that this is fade to black for steamy scenes so if you're somebody who likes your romance without a lot of steam to it this might give you what you want. Personally I mean I am okay with fade to black but I wanted a little bit more of the sensuality evoked between the two of them. I think we are told that they're really into each other and you know they do get together but there's some but something about like the sensation of it is missing for me and I I don't know I am not a writer myself I'm sure that can be hard to do but you know there are some writers who can make you really feel what the characters are feeling or get a sense of 
what they're feeling and this felt a little flat to me so as much as I liked it I wanted a little bit more from it but I do think it's cute I do think it does a good job with the issues that it's tackling and I think if you're somebody who would like to read a romance that is not super spicy this could be a great option I also gave four stars to The Buried and the Bound by Rochelle Hassan this is one that I had as a review copy from NetGalley and I liked it it's a debut YA contemporary fantasy also dealing with kind of fey mythology but with a more diverse cast of characters so if that is something that you're looking for I think this is a great option. It reads like something that actual teenagers will enjoy reading. It follows three characters, one of whom is an American girl of Middle Eastern heritage who is a hedge witch. Then there is a teen boy dealing with a family curse that means that he has lost all of his memories of the love of his life. And lastly, there is another teen boy who has made a deal with an evil hag in the forest that he perhaps regrets. So there's like dark magic and adventure. It's clearly intended to be a start of the series. It's got queer representation and there's also a lot of pining and angst and longing and yeah I thought it was a really good time. Not a new favorite for me but I think a really solid debut and one that a lot of people would enjoy. I also gave four stars to Blood Debts by Terry J. Benton Walker and I'm gonna pop up the cover for it because it is beautiful. This is another debut YA contemporary fantasy. Don't let the cover fool you. I feel like the cover gives 20s vibes, but it's actually set in the modern day in a alternate version of Louisiana where there is magic. And this one would make a great television show like on the CW or on Netflix. It is very high drama. It's got a large cast of characters including a lot of people of color. It's like teens dealing with family curses and dark magic and exploring their sexuality and the you know politics of this magic system and people dealing with racism and homophobia. I really liked this one. I think a lot of people will enjoy it. Again, I'm, I'm telling you now, it is high drama. So if you don't like that kind of vibe, the like CW TV show vibe or the like Netflix teen drama vibe, maybe stay away because it has a lot of that. But I had a good time with it and I could see this being really popular. I hope somebody picks it up for adaptation because this would be a fantastic one to adapt. Do check content warnings if you need them because there are a lot of them. I think I have some of them in my Goodreads review. In my Goodreads is always linked down below. This gets a little bit on the violent side and on the sexy side. It does have gay representation and the author is a gay black man so I think seeing that in this context is great and it's pretty sex positive in the way it handles things. The female characters are also written really well so you know I mean are they messy? Yes. Are they nuanced? Also yes. So four stars to this. It wasn't necessarily a perfect book but a really good debut and one that again I think would make a fantastic adaptation. Need to change the battery but we we will be back with my final four star read. And I am back. My final four star read of January was Against the Current by Olivia Matthews. This I had as an audio review copy from NetGalley and it was very cute. If you are a cozy mystery person I would recommend checking this out. It is the start of a brand new series called The Spice Isles Bakery I think. It follows an Afro-Caribbean woman in Brooklyn who is opening a brand new bakery with her family where they're going to be selling food that showcases their heritage. But of course on the day of their grand opening the cantankerous owner of the bakery down the street comes in and tells her that she's trying to steal his business and is going to shut her down and she sort of threateningly asks him to leave the store only to find out that not long after he has shown up dead and she is now the primary murder suspect and so while opening this bakery she must also try to uncover who the real murderer was and prove that it wasn't her. This is kind of your classic cozy mystery setup but with a lot more diversity which I think is fantastic. If you're a fan of cozy mysteries I think this is a pretty good one. Reviews on this are a little bit mixed. I think some people with this heritage say that not everything is exactly perfect. 
So, you know, take that into consideration. Who knows how much of that is an editor saying to change things to make it more relatable. I just don't know like what goes into all of that behind the scenes. But I enjoyed this. I gave it four stars. I think it's a solid beginning to a new series. And we do get hints at a coming love triangle. She's got a couple of potential love interests, one of whom is her high school crush, who is now a police detective. And of course, he's also one of the ones who's accusing her of possibly being a murderer. So drama. Um, um, yeah, I liked it. Four stars. Worth a look if this is your genre. Next up, we have eight books that got four and a half stars. I had a lot of four and a half stars this month, more than usual. Two of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap-up. Those books are Where We All Go When All We Were Was Gone by Sequoia Nagamatsu and The Undertaking of Heart and Mercy by Megan Bannon. If you want to hear about those, go check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also gave four and a half stars to the other two Antigone adaptations that I read for my Antigone video. Again, I'm not going to say too much about them here, just a little bit, but I'll direct you to that video if you want to hear more. The first one is Antigona Gonzalez by Sara Uribe, and this was actually a gift from Kara at Wild Book Garden, so thank you to her. Um, this, she was also the one that put this on my radar. This is kind of a cool little retelling of Antigone where each page has the Spanish version on one side and the English translation on the other. It is set in Mexico and reframing the Antigone story as a Mexican woman dealing with the fact that her brother has disappeared and she doesn't know if he's dead or alive and she wants answers and wants to at the very least get a body so that she can grieve his loss if he's no longer living. And this is speaking to some of the issues with violence and political violence taking place in Latin America. Really, really love this. I thought it was great. Four and a half stars, would recommend. And then the other one is Home Fire by Kamala Shamsi. This was the 2018 winner of the Women's Prize for Fiction. And I suspect people have probably read this and maybe didn't know it was an Antigone retelling. I'm not going to get into the details of it here. If you, again, go check out the Antigone video if you want to hear more. But this is set in the modern UK and it is a book tackling some big issues. It's dealing with Islamophobia, it's dealing with terrorism and the grooming and radicalization of young Muslim men, but also the uh, grief that family left behind has to deal with about grappling with your identity. Like there's just, there's a lot of nuance here. I really loved it a lot and I think it's worth reading. I also gave four and a half stars to The Last Wish by Andrzej Sapkowski. This was a reread for me and I think I enjoyed it even more on a reread to be honest. I am not going to say too much about this because Liana and I have a podcast episode where we went live and discussed this in great detail so I will link that video up above if you want to go and check it out but we are doing a year-long read-along for The Witcher series over on Chapter 3 podcast. This is the first short story collection set in that world and it's kind of fun because most of the stories are fairy tale retellings that kind of subvert your expectations and I really enjoyed it. I also gave four and a half stars to The Oleander Sword by Tasha Suri. I pre-ordered this last year and finally got around to reading it in the readathon that I did with my patrons in January because we had some prompts including like read one of your pre-orders that you didn't get to and so this was my pick for that. I really loved it. The Jasmine Throne was one of my favorite books the year that it came out and while I didn't love this as much. I do think it has some second book syndrome and like there would be valid critiques of it, but I had such a good time with this book. Yes, all of the political intrigue, the magic, and morally gray lesbians longing for each other. I like I do think in terms of pacing, this book does feel like the middle of a book of a trilogy. There is a lot of sort of moving pieces on the chessboard but I still loved it. I had such a good time with this. And there were some big twists and turns and reveals. There were a couple of things that I had wondered a bit about in book one that given book, book two, I think I'm probably right or maybe right. Uh, yeah, it's great. And it, it ends on another big cliffhanger. What will happen? I'm very excited for book three, but we're not going to get it for two years. So um, I will be waiting with bated breath. Thank you, Tasha. Tasha Suri is always amazing. I also gave four and a half stars to The Night Eaters by Marjorie Liu and Sana Takeda. This was actually a gift from Mara Books Like Whoa, so thank you Mara for sending me a copy. They're the team that writes the monstrous graphic novels, which I love, and this is a new horror project that they're working on together that I think is really fantastic. It does a great job of definitely leaning into the horror 
side of it while also having a lot to say about parent-child dynamics across generations and especially when you have parents who immigrated. In this case you have parents who immigrated from China and kids who grew up in the United States. It's got multiple timelines and uh yeah, I don't want to say too much about this because it's pretty quick, but I loved it. One thing to note is that the modern day timeline does take place during the COVID pandemic, which some people might not love. I actually really like it. I think while it is subtle, there's definitely this undercurrent of talking about some of the racism that Asian people, especially Chinese people, were dealing with during the pandemic. And I mean, probably still now, but especially at that time. Um, yeah, excellent. It was great. I need volume two. My final four and a half star read was The Crane Husband by Kelly Barnhill. Whew, man, this is a little novella <laughs> that is really intense and for sure packs a punch. Heads up that this is a book that is dealing with domestic violence and it is, it's an, it's a lot. It's, it's a lot to read, but it's really good. It's a retelling of the crane wife story, but putting a different spin on it. And it's told from the perspective of a 15 year old girl who is watching her mother become the victim of domestic violence and trying to protect her younger brother through the process but with this kind of magical overlay to it. So definitely dark, but I think handles the issues that it's dealing with really well. Ugh. Yeah, it was, um, it was intense to read, but really good. This comes out in February. I had an early copy, so thank you to the publisher for that. Next is my five star reads. This month there were seven of them and four of them I talked about in my mid-month wrap up. Those books are Olaju The Edge of Origins by Peter Chizoba Daniel, Kid Trailblazers by Robin Stevenson, The Fire Next Time by James Baldwin, and Razorblade Tears by S.A. Cosby. If you want to hear about any of those, go check out my mid-month wrap-up. I also gave five stars to Amari and the Night Brothers by B.B. Alston. This was a reread for me, and I mean, like, I just love this. I think this is one of the best middle grade fantasy books we've gotten in a long time. I need to read Amari and the Great Game. Very excited to I think this is fantastic. I've talked about this before, so I'm not going to go into great detail. I do have a Goodreads review, but if you haven't read this, like, highly recommend. It's great. I also gave five stars to The Wild Robot by Peter Brown. This is one of the books that I read to my kids before bed, and I really, really liked this. It took me by surprise, to be honest. It's interesting. I would actually call this cozy science fiction, but for a middle grade audience. It is a story about a robot who accidentally ends up washing up on the beach of this island and becoming friends with animals and stuff, but you get glimpses of this dystopian future that it's all taking place in. So climate change has become a problem. There are robots doing like everything pretty much in the human world now, but it's like this really beautiful, charming little book. The robot ends up becoming an adoptive mother to a little gosling, and it's the cutest thing ever. I really enjoyed this. Also, it is excellent for reading aloud because it's very simple prose with relatively short sentences. It feels very calming to read, which I think is, is great before bed. And while it does deal directly with some difficult topics, it deals with death, it deals with grief and loss, it does it in a way that still offers the comfort that kids this age I think need. So my kids loved it, I really loved it, and now I want to go read all the books in the series. We are in fact now reading the sequel to this, The Wild Robot Escapes Before Bed, and then I just found out that there's a third book that just got published at the end of January, so I may be picking that up as well. So um, if you have kids this age, definitely would recommend this. I think it's excellent. My final five-star read of January was Lud in the Mist by Hope Mir Lees. This was such a pleasant surprise, and it's another one where there is a live show. This was for the Blades and Bodice Rippers book club hosted over on Leanna's channel, so I will link that somewhere if I can. And uh, me and Leanna both gave it five stars and nobody hated it. It was great. Like Amanda was like a three star read, but this is the first book we've had in a really long time where all of us at least like mostly liked it. I, I loved this. It is pre-Tolkien fantasy written by a woman. It came out in 1926 and it has like fae 
it's really interesting tonally because it is both whimsical and creepy and philosophical all at the same time. I love the character work in this. I think it is fascinating to see the way that this woman from this time period is drawing these characters and like the relationships between men and women and the internal lives of these male characters. I just so much to discuss with this. I think it was a really great live show and we had a lot to talk about. Um, but I love this. I would definitely recommend it. I will say the, the language is a bit antiquated. I had to look a few things up in the dictionary, but it, it was so good. I see why people like Neil Gaiman have loved this. Lastly, in January, I had two books that got six stars, which is what I give to a favorite of the year. And I had two of them. Both of these just kind of blew me away. The first one, I, I have to give the disclaimer, I am kind of friends with the author. So did I probably go into this book with like some added goodwill? Yes. However, I will note that I have not had a problem with being critical of books by friends that I had criticisms to make of in the past. And, you know, believe me or don't, but like genuinely, I think this book is amazing. And that is Delicious Monsters by Lizelle Sambury. Lizelle is an author tuber here. And uh, we know each other. We're not like close friends, but like we know each other. And I was lucky enough to get an early copy of this. It comes out in late February and I was on the book tour. So if you missed it, I have a video that I can link up above where I talk about this book and then also recommend a bunch of other great horror novels with creepy houses and schools because there is a central creepy house to this book. Oh god this book is so good and so smart and I'm like I still thinking about this book and could see wanting to reread it at some point. Y'all <laughs> like she did such a good job with, she did such a good job with this. So this has two timelines, one of which is kind of a framing device. The framing device is following a young black woman who has a streaming series she runs that investigates like hauntings and stuff. She is coming out of having had an abusive mother and for this season of the show they're going to investigate this house where a black girl disappeared 10 years prior. In the past timeline, we're following a girl named Daisy who can see dead people. And she also has a complicated relationship with her mom. This is a book that tackles some really heavy issues. It deals with abuse and grooming. It also deals with cycles of trauma, messy parent-child relationships, having a narcissistic parent, um, in addition to things like racism. So there's a lot here, but it uses horror as a way to talk about those things. But Daisy and her mom go and move to this mysterious estate in rural Canada, and there is a house that is probably haunted and people die and a lot of really creepy stuff happens. Lizelle goes really hard with the body horror. <laughs> like this is definitely horror, uh, especially for it, it. It is YA, but I would say upper YA and adults could definitely read this as well. There are so many layers to unpack here and so much nuance and twists that I did not expect. I thought this was excellent, like really, really excellent. And I loved it. Easily one of the best things that I've read in January. And my final six star read of January is Dawn by Octavia Butler. Y'all, does Octavia Butler ever miss? All her books are so good. This one I could not put down. I just kind of on a whim, I mean, it was on my sci-fi fantasy TBR for the year, but I was like, hey, I also have the audiobook. Let me just like start it. And I didn't want to stop. It just had me in a chokehold, y'all. It's so good and so smart and weird, but oh my goodness. This is one that I feel like you could spend so much time unpacking, easily could have its own video. And I talk a little bit about this in my Goodreads review, which again, my Goodreads is always linked down below. But this is the start of a science fiction trilogy following a woman who has been rescued from the devastation of Earth by aliens who now have made some genetic changes to her and want her to lead a group of humans back to a 
new version of Earth where they want to have them have children that are like genetically a combination of the aliens. Anyway, it's it's a whole it's a whole thing. So there's there are a lot of like really weird and unsettling things, which is intentional. I think Octavia Butler is not afraid to do things that are unsettling and disturbing. And this deals a lot with issues of consent and what it means and lack of consent. And I think intentionally, now this is not, I think, what the entire book is intended to be, but I do think that there are intentionally some similarities between the experience of our main character and what we know were the experiences of some enslaved Black people who came to the United States. I, I, it's not like a one-for-one -one allegory, but I do think it's intended to be something pushing on some of those buttons of like race and gender yeah, it's mm, so good. Like, so good. Octavia Butler was just brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And I really, really want to keep reading the series. I thought it was fantastic. There you go. I read a lot in January, but I read a lot of amazing things that I loved. And I am excited to be heading into February with having hopefully another really strong reading month with some great things to tell you about. Talk to me in the comments down below. Let me know any of your thoughts or feelings on anything I talked about in this video. And for your question of the day, maybe talk to me about rereads. Are you a rereader? I am not a huge rereader, but I do like to read some books over again that are favorites occasionally, not as frequently as some people do. Some people are like, big rereaders, some people never reread. How do you approach it? Let me know in the comments down below. If you like this video, it always helps if you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.